I wanted to have a chance to discuss with you um, some issues concerning hydraulic fracturing. As an engineer you, and a, a long-standing uh, researcher in how objects and uh, faults fracture, um, you know, what insights uh, you have uh, in terms of the sorts of questions that, uh, that regulators, policy makers and others don't actually ask you? The single most important aspect of unconventional gas development from shale that hardly anybody gets, and I'm talking about the general public, policymakers, even regulators, the only entities that get it are the operators and a few individuals like myself who really understand the nexus between geology, geochemistry, engineering, science, and technology. And let me tell you what that issue, issue is. It's called spatial intensity. As you know, people are a bit upset about how things have progressed in a place like Pennsylvania with Marcella Shale. What people don't understand yet is that we haven't even started. Pennsylvania has been being developed for shale gas since 2007. And in that period of time, there have been roughly 5,500 wells drilled, and people think, well, that's a lot. But of those 5,500 wells that have been drilled, only about half have been fracked. And that half that's been fracked constitute about 2%, 2% of the eventual so-called build-out of Pennsylvania. So someone could fly over all of the areas of Pennsylvania right now that have been developed from Marcellus and say, well, that ain't so bad. That's not, that's not like mountaintop removal in West Virginia. Well, not yet. <laughs> Only about 2% of the wells that are going to be fracked have been fracked. Yet, if we look at the consequences already, the number of individual private water wells that have already been contaminated, the number of health incidences that have occurred, uh, the number of spills that have occurred, the number of truck accidents that have occurred, it's pretty simple now to start forecasting, prognosing, crystal ball gazing, and say, well, what's it going to be like if it's like this with 2%, what's it going to be like at 10%? What's it going to be like at 20%? It's going to be hellacious. The industry knows it. The gas is everywhere there's shale. Not in uniform quantities, of course. They still have to drill exploration wells to find their so-called hot spots. A county here, a county there. But all of the prognoses that I'm reading out of the industry literature is that New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, Maryland, a little bit of Virginia, um, are going to be subjected to at least 200,000 Marcella shale gas wells. And that's just the Marcellus. Of course, they promise us there's also the Utica and a couple of others. So I'm repeating myself, but the single most important aspect that nobody gets yet is that it hasn't even started yet. Mm -hmm. For those of us following up on this uh, who are in the healthcare area, one of the big concerns mm -hmm. is that there should be a pathway for exposure. In other words, mm -hmm. is there a way in which either the uh, chemicals that we're putting into slick water or into drilling muds or the flowback uh, produced waters mm -hmm. or the uh, emissions coming back out mm -hmm. as fugitive emissions, is there any way that that can uh, actually uh, expose people? Sure. The pathways are numerous and obvious. Uh, I categorize them as from deep underground, from the surface, and from the air. And this kind of intense spatial development, number one, as I just said, is going to poke a few hundred thousand holes in the ground that weren't there. 330 million years of sequestration of hydrocarbons, heavy metals, salts, naturally occurring radioactive material is being desequestered. We're taking all that out and putting fresh water down. Brilliant. What an exchange. What we just spent the last 30 or 40 million years doing, which is sequestering a lot of carbon dioxide and putting a lot of water, drinkable water, on the surface of the earth. We're reversing it. Thank you. Wonderful. So, yeah, uh, poking a couple hundred thousand holes in the Marcellus, every one of those holes has to have a gasket. Mm -hmm. It's called a cement job. 
And we, we know that those gaskets fail at an alarming rate initially mm -hmm. because they're really hard to put in place. And most of them will fail eventually. By eventually, I mean within a lifetime of a human. Mm -hmm. Which means we're going to have tens of thousands of leaky gaskets. Mm -hmm. And that means everything that was down there, sequestered, now has a pathway upwards into an underground source of drinking water or all the way to the surface. Mm -hmm. So that's pathway number one poking all those holes and not being able to gasket them while they're operating and then successfully plug them when all these wells go out of operation. So we're postponing a major part of the problem. At the surface, you have to bring chemicals to a well pad and then you have to bring those chemicals and all the other waste products away from the well pad. That means transporting and storing. Anytime you transport and store, store hazardous material, you run the risk of spills. Mm -hmm. And obviously, since it's spatially intense, mm -hmm. we're going to have lots of trucks, we're going to have lots of waste pits, we're going to have lots of pipelines, all of which at some point or another are going to cause some level of problem. And then finally, air. What comes up out of the well is a gas. Mm -hmm. Not just one gas, but all the other sisters and brothers of methane that want to come along for the ride. And not all of it goes into the pipeline. Right? As we know, and as we're learning, um, a significant amount of it gets into the air uh, in the form of um, hydrocarbon-based pollutants near the well pads that is capable of influencing people within a few miles, mm -hmm. uh, but also on a global scale. Again, spatial intensity. You got to put 200,000 wells in Pennsylvania, New York, West Virginia, Ohio, all those wells and all their ancillary infrastructure, compressor stations, processing stations, pipelines, storage units, they leak. So we're going to be contributing to climate change uh, in a way and at a time that we can least afford to. And to then say that this is the transition fuel that gets us to a sustainable and clean and climate friendly future is <coughs> absurd. It's walking the plank. There's, it's not a bridge. Yeah. A bridge has a near end and a far end. You want to get to the other end. This is a plank. Here we are. That's where we're going with this. You're one of the uh, founding board members of Physician Scientists and Engineers for, uh, mm -hmm. for Healthy Energy alongside myself. Mm -hmm. um, this organization is conceived as a multidisciplinary group mm -hmm. uh, with people from a range of different backgrounds. Um, how would you say uh, this type of collaboration uh, is important in addressing the science and the evidence uh, of this new technology? It's fundamentally the right combination of expertise. Um, as I tell the various um, agreed landowners, sometimes they're lawyers who contact me for information, how can we prove a case? No one person has all the expertise. Case in point, any one of these 200,000 wells that are going to be drilled in the Marcellus over the next N years can leak initially. Well, somebody has to be able to say, I understand the technology and the engineering of drilling, casing, cementing, and fracking a well. And I understand all the things that can go wrong. I understand why they go wrong. I understand when they go wrong. And I understand where they go wrong. So if I read a well record, a daily diary that's kept by the operator mm -hmm. of every single thing that happens on a well, then I can pinpoint this is what went wrong, this is why it went wrong, this is where it went wrong, and this is when it went wrong. But that's insufficient. Mm -hmm. okay. Next thing you have to have is a geohydrologist who can say, well, if that went wrong there, then, here are the consequences from a groundwater flow point of view. Mm -hmm. If the well is, the gas well is upgradient of somebody's water well, and I can say what leaked from this well, when it started leaking, and where it started leaking, then the next person in the train, chain, another kind of engineer or scientist, geohydrologist, can say, and one, two, three days later, or three weeks later, or one year later, we can expect this concentration of contaminants to arrive in this person's well water. And that's not sufficient. Okay. What else so, do you need? Well, you need the engineer to say what went right. wrong. You need the scientist to say and what the consequence was. Mm -hmm. And then somebody down there has to be a health professional that says, I can match up the contaminants 
the chemistry of those contaminants, the hazardous nature of those contaminants, with the health consequences of the people who drank that water or breathe that air. That's called chain of evidence, from my point of view. Okay, you got to have at least those three engineer, scientist, physician working together to show causality. There's a lot of coincidence making um, that the industry always says, well, it was just a coincidence. You're, the well was always contaminated. You just noticed it now because we came into town. And on the other side, the extremist environmentalists, the, the people who don't think it all through, immediately draw causality conclusions from what might just be coincidence. Mm -hmm. But you really need an organization like PSE um, and its constituents, its advisors, its board, its members, uh, who, who have all the kinds of technical expertise necessary to observe, cause, and prove effect. And uh, one of the things that uh, PSC is very concerned about as an organization is that the evidence uh, is presented in vetted, uh, peer-reviewed publications. Why is that so important? It's fundamentally important because in our society, in our civilization, um, the cornerstone, the wellspring, the gold standard of evidence is anonymous peer review. Without it, we're all bloggers. We're just opinionators. Uh, my opinion is as good as yours. Um, my blog has fancier graphics. More people read my blog, therefore I should be believed. I'm sorry. No, that's not the way it works. I'm very concerned that not only do we have the kinds of pollution that we've already been, we've been talking about, water pollution, air pollution, people pollution, we're seeing science pollution, uh, the diminution uh, of, of the importance of uh, anonymous peer review mm -hmm. um, as exercised by the very best journals um, administered by the best editorial boards. Um, people who have not are not going to be influenced by financial conflict of interest or by personal aggrandizement. On average, that's the whole idea. You mm -hmm, have enough mm -hmm. people working at any journal mm -hmm. on the editorial boards in their in their reviewer uh, suite uh, and in their publisher to know that they have in that journal uh, a very grave responsibility for society. Mm -hmm. It's at least as important as the responsibility that the media have. Mm -hmm. I would argue it's even more important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because without the ability for um, bringing the conversation to an end here, the people, the citizenry, the policymakers, the legislators, the regulators, to discern best science from somebody's opinion, mm -hmm. it's hopeless. Thank you very much, Tony. Yeah.